This video is an adaptation of a thread called Polysynthesis for Novices on the ZBB written by Huimems, who kindly permitted me to reproduce it in this form. I have edited and trimmed it, but it remains mostly the same. Let us begin. I've written this introduction to help conlangers figure out how they could design a polysynthetic language, and I've tried to make it interesting and informative for people who are simply interested in linguistics, so be warned that at times it may be pretty dense. For length and simplicity, I've avoided discussing the more recent theoretical work on noun incorporation and non-configurationality, etc. The descriptions here are designed to give an overview and help with conlanger or amateur linguistics. They are not meant to withstand a rigorous investigation of all the details, nor to represent the consensus view of all linguists. Those who are interested should continue to look into such matters on their own. And naturally, I welcome any additional comments, examples, corrections, or questions, etc. from anyone. These are the topics we'll look at. What is polysynthesis? Let's start with the basics. What does it mean to say that a language is polysynthetic? It's a rather vague term, and has been used in different ways by different people. Since synthesis refers to the general ratio of morphemes per word in a given language, ultimately all polysynthetic means is that a language has a large number of morphemes per word. In practice, this generally means that the language has verbs that show polypersonal agreement, permits noun incorporation within verbs, makes extensive use of affixes to mark other categories, such as adverbial notions expressed with separate words in less synthetic languages like English, has relatively free word order, and is predominantly head marking. Not all polysynthetic languages have all of these characteristics. Some Eskimo alien languages, for example, lack noun incorporation under most definitions, but most polysynthetic languages probably have most of them. The upshot is that you can get entire sentences expressed in a single long verb in polysynthetic languages. In fact, this is a common definition for polysynthesis, and one of Evans and Sass's definitions is, polysynthetic languages represent, in a single verbal word, what in English takes an entire multi-word clause. Here's a handful of examples to help you get the feel for how such languages work before moving on to a more detailed discussion of each of the aforementioned traits in turn. Note that polysynthetic languages are not evenly distributed geographically. They're extremely common in North America, and fairly common in Central and South America, Siberia, the Caucasus, Northern Australia, and New Guinea. Elsewhere, they are considerably rarer. A quick summary. If you're a real noob to linguistic stuff, in this section I'll summarise the very basic ideas of polysynthetic languages so that you can get started on trying to create your own. But this necessarily means a lot will be oversimplified, so be forewarned. For the most basic beginner's purposes, a polysynthetic language is a language where verb prefix and suffixes, together called affixes, are used to mark a lot of the information that in more familiar languages like English is conveyed with separate words. This usually includes affixes which identify the subject and intransitive verbs the object, any tense, aspect or mood distinctions the language makes, noun roots incorporated into or compounded with the verb to qualify it or identify participants like its former object or intransitive subject, and a host of other notions like directions, adverbial notions, and so on. Polysynthetic languages revolve around their verbs. Most of the work of identifying who was doing what to whom, in what manner, using what instruments, etc. is all accomplished on the verb, and highly inflected verbs with no other nouns or other words can often stand as a full, complete sentence. Polypersonal agreement. Polypersonal agreement means that a verb marks multiple core arguments. To oversimplify for a moment, this basically means that both the subject and the object of a clause are marked on the verb. Different languages will distinguish different characteristics that are marked, person, number, gender, and so on, but usually the grammatical role of each participant is made clear in some way via verbal affixes. Everyone here will already be familiar with a language that marks verbs for at least one core participant. Even English does so marginally, like the s suffix in drinks marks that the subject of the verb is third person singular. Romance languages, which will be familiar to most people watching, provide a somewhat better example, with verbs marking the person and number of their subject by means of suffixes, which also mark tense, aspect, and mood. As in Spanish, hablo, hablas, habla, hablamos, hablais, hablan. Polysynthetic languages then simply extend this type of marking further, and verbs mark both the subject and object. Again, this is oversimplifying, we'll get to complications later. For example, take the baniva of Isana verb, rika pani. This breaks down as follows. As you can see, the verb marks the gender, number, and person, and grammatical role of each argument of the verb. 
Not all polysynthetic languages have separate affixes for subjects and objects, however. In many cases, the morphemes are partly or entirely fused together, such that a single affix marks the person, number, etc. of both subject and object. A good example is the Iroquoian languages. For instance, the Seneca verbal prefix se marks both that the subject is second person and that the object is plural, as in asheoi. For another example, consider the Caraban language Dequana, where wu indicates a first person subject and third person object, while y indicates a third person subject and first person object. Thus, contrast wedanta, I met him or her, with yedanta, she or he meets me. Finally, note that in many cases, polysynthetic languages can mark more than just two participants on the verb. Some other roles that can be indicated include benefactives, indirect objects, and so on, like in the Abkhaz word dbltart. Noun incorporation. Noun incorporation is ultimately a form of compounding. It combines a noun root or stem with a verb to create a new verb with a more specific meaning. English has some marginal examples, such as berry pick or mountain climb. Here, a noun is combined with a verb to form a new verb with a narrower scope than the original verb, referring now to specific kinds of picking or climbing. However, the English examples aren't very good analogues to the much more productive systems of languages that make heavy use of noun incorporation. For example, in English, verbs with incorporated nouns can usually only appear with further derivation, either as actor or activity de-verbals, such as he's a mountain climber, or she went berry picking. Note, before we get on to the various types of noun incorporation, that all forms share several qualities. First, noun incorporation is normally a valence-adjusting phenomenon. In other words, if a verb incorporates what was previously its direct object, the new verb will have its valency reduced by one, namely from transitive to intransitive, or from ditransitive to transitive. Secondly, incorporated nouns are almost always uninflected, unspecified roots. In most languages, noun roots are never incorporated along with case markers or plurality markers or noun class markers or articles or demonstratives. I'll give a brief example to illustrate this point from Binyin Gun Wok. Note how the noun root, when incorporated into the verb in the second example, no longer has a prefix marking noun class. Very often, as well, the incorporated form of a noun may differ from the form it assumes as a free nominal. This may be a regular process. In Algonquian languages, for instance, the incorporated forms of nouns beginning in M usually lose the M. An irregular process, or even a suppletive process with some nouns, where the incorporated form has no obvious phonological connection to the freestanding noun. Also, note that there's a restriction in all languages on what nouns can be incorporated. As far as I know, no language regularly allows the incorporation of a transitive subject into the verb. Verbs in various languages can incorporate their patient argument, intransitive subject or transitive direct object, or obliques like locations and instrumentals associated with the verb, but agents are never incorporated. Evidently, there are also no known languages in which benefactives or indirect objects, like receivers, can be incorporated. All this is probably a side effect of the use of noun incorporation to background incorporated participants. More on that later. As one final note, be aware that in some languages more than one noun can be incorporated into a single verb. For example, the following Quiba verb has three incorporated nouns. Most polysynthetic languages make use of noun incorporation, though the exact systems and their level of productiveness will vary from language to language, and, of course, not all languages with noun incorporation are polysynthetic. Mira and Mithen's work, which I'm drawing on very heavily in this section, distinguishes several types and uses of noun incorporation. The first type is the most basic, noun-verb compounds deriving new verbs, with the incorporated noun root serving to narrow the scope of the original verb root. Compare, for instance, these two Yucatec Maya examples, the first with a separate nominal, and the second with a noun root incorporated into the verb to narrow the scope of the activity described. More advanced types of noun incorporation, however, can be used for more complex syntactic and discourse effects. The second type is a way of promoting former obliques to subject or direct object status by incorporating the former subject or direct object of the verb. This strategy is used in many languages, like when the underlying subject or direct object does not play a major role in the discourse and the speaker wishes to focus more on the effect the action has on some person or participant who is not an underlying core argument of the verb. For example, English often has body parts as the subjects or direct objects of verbs of feeling. My head hurts. She hit my knee. 
The second type of noun incorporation allows the underlying subject or direct object to be incorporated into the verb, which means the affected participant can now be cast as the subject or direct object. In English, the examples given, this would be the equivalent of I head hurt or she knee hit me. Well, I am now the focus of both verbs rather than my head or my knee. All languages which use noun incorporation for this purpose also use it in type 1 situations described before, to narrow the scope of the verb. A real life example of this sort of thing is the following, again from Yucatec Maya. Note how the object changes from the tree in the first sentence to the cornfield in the second. Here's another real life example, this time from Blackfoot. The third use of noun incorporation takes place on the level of the discourse, rather than an individual clause or sentence. This use of noun incorporation backgrounds established nouns. In languages with type 3 noun incorporation, a noun is generally introduced into the discourse with the separate nominal, but further mentions of it, now that it's established material, are often incorporated into the verb, unless the noun is highly focused. All languages which use type 3 noun incorporation also use types 1 and 2. As an example of type 3, consider the following Koryak text. When the whale is first mentioned, it is referred to with a separate noun. After that, it is incorporated into the verb as established information. The final type of noun incorporation is the incorporation of semantically broad noun roots in order to classify or specify the verb action. The verb can then, in addition, still take over nominals marking subject and object. This is essentially the use of noun incorporation as a classificatory system. In fact, in many cases, a participant is first introduced with both an overt nominal and classificatory incorporation on the verb, and then for future reference to the participant, all that is needed is to make use of the incorporated classifying nominal. A long but useful example is the following excerpt from a Mohawk story. <laughs> Note that the bullheads are first introduced with a separate nominal, rabahbo, but also with a classifying incorporated nominal in the verb itsi, meaning fish. The story continues, telling of how the speaker's uncle found and caught the fish, and then. In all these subsequent sentences, the bullheads are referred to only through the incorporated noun root it, functioning as something of a classifier. Mithen reports that languages with productive use of type 4 noun incorporation will have all of types 1, 2, and 3 as well. Mithin's paper was written a number of years ago, and I understand there have been a number of refinements or alternative theoretical approaches proposed by various researchers since then, but the basic rubric is probably close enough to the truth that it can be extremely useful to conlangers. Other affixes. So to summarise what we've covered so far, polysynthetic languages are basically languages in which verbs are frequently very long, consisting of a number of morphemes, and which often are the equivalent of entire English sentences. In part, this is explained by the ability of polysynthetic languages to mark the person, number, gender, or whatever, of both the subject and object on the verb, and by the ability of many polysynthetic languages to incorporate into the verb a noun root or noun roots to serve various semantic and discourse functions. But, these factors alone don't fully explain the length of verbs in many polysynthetic languages. Most, perhaps all, polysynthetic languages also use verbal affixes to mark other notions that in languages like English are expressed with separate words. These often include a tremendous range of notions, adverbial ideas, temporal ideas, verbal or complementing ideas, locational and directional ideas, instrumental ideas, and many others. Here I will give a few more examples with some discussion to help demonstrate the range of possible notions which can be expressed. This is not meant to be exhaustive, and note that polysynthetic languages also generally use verb morphology to accomplish a range of valency-adjusting operations like causation and passivization, as well as much of the tense, aspect and mood information of the clause, but since these are more familiar categories, I won't address them here. Ojibwe is an Algonquian language of the Great Lakes region, and also the polysynthetic language I know best. For our purposes, I'm only going to focus on a handful of the concepts that can be expressed in Ojibwe via verb morphology, in addition to polypersonal marking and noun incorporation, both of which Ojibwe has. For one thing, the Ojibwe verb suffixes, which 
observed to mark transitivity and the animacy of the absolute participant often carry fairly concrete semantic notions as well, expressing things like environmental descriptions or action, instrumentals, orientation, motion or movement, and so on. Like other Algonquian languages, Ojibwe also has several classificatory verb affixes, which specify the shape and consistency, etc., of a participant, normally an absolute or oblique. These include the following, and some examples are as follows. Evidentiality is the marking of the source of the speaker's information, and several polysynthetic languages make use of sophisticated morphologically marked evidential systems, though a number of languages with evidentiality are far from polysynthetic. For example, Tariana distinguishes five evidentials marked with suffixes that also mark tense, visual, non-visual, inferred, assumed, and reported. And examples illustrating all five evidentials in the recent past tense are as follows. Like other Eskimo alien languages, Central Alaskan Yupik has hundreds of derivational suffixes, called postbases, which can be added to noun or verb roots to create new stems. Note that in many cases, constructions like this are very similar to noun incorporation or other compounding. The main difference is that these suffixes do not represent free verbs. That is, they are bound suffixes and cannot be used without attaching to a host root. I'll go through these examples quickly, so pause if you need to. Some postbases attach to nominal roots and create new nouns. Some postbases attach to verb roots but create new nouns. Some postbases attach to verb roots and create new verbs. And finally, some postbases attach to nominal roots but create new verbs. These are the cases that strongly resemble noun incorporation. Many languages of the northwest coast of North America have hundreds of suffixes, called lexical suffixes, which are bound, like the Yupik derivational suffixes we've just seen, but which otherwise carry extremely concrete lexical meanings. Aside from their bound nature, and the fact that they normally have no obvious etymological connection to corresponding free nouns, the lexical suffixes with nominal meanings are indistinguishable from noun roots. Likewise, aside from their bound nature and the fact that they normally have no obvious etymological connection to corresponding free verbs, the lexical suffixes with verbal meanings are indistinguishable from verb roots. The same can be said of lexical suffixes with locational, directional, adverbial, etc. meanings. Here is a sample of just a few of the 400 odd lexical suffixes of Nuwakashan a Wakashan language of British Columbia. And, as before, I'll be going through these quickly, so you might want to pause the video. Some of the suffixes are very verbal in meaning, and in fact the resulting stem is a verb. Others are more nominal in meaning, and the resulting stem is a noun. One of the most notable usage of lexical suffixes, though, is in conveying extremely precise indications of location, space, orientation, direction, and movement. Many of these are body part terms. This final example is a single word which illustrates just how much information can be packed into a single verb in this way. Or take the following example sentence as well for a second example. Kawasati is a Muscogean language of Texas and Louisiana, with one of the most elaborate verbal systems I've ever seen. The verbal template can be represented as follows, with 9 prefix slots and 15 suffix slots. What follows are merely some examples. For the prefixes, slot 9 marks the object of the verb as being indefinite. Slot 8 marks the directionality of the verb, either coming or going. Slot 7 is instrumental, either just a plane with, or at a distance, or containing something. Slot 6 is distributive or iterative. Slot 3 is for specific locatives, of which there are 9, on the ground or in a fire, in water, raised up, on a vertical plane, in the middle of or in twain, on a face, on a mouth, or on a throat. Well, the suffix is, slot 1 is for adverbs like very, almost, really, in the same way, all the time, must, etc. Slot 4 marks an intended action. Slot 5 marks ability to do something. Slot 7 is deductive. Slot 8 marks other modalities like almost and hypotheticals. Slot 9 marks doubt about what the speaker is saying. Slot 10 marks that the speaker's information is second-hand or was said by another person. Slot 11 marks the speaker's information as coming from a sound. And slot 13 marks consequences of five kinds. First are potential or unreal consequences, second are generalised possibilities, third marks the reason for something, 
fourth marks contrast, like the English word but, and the fifth marks but as well, but in scenarios where what occurs is contrary to expectation. That's the end of part one, and in part two we'll be looking at free word order, how polysynthesis arises, and where to go from there. Welcome to Fireside Polysynthesis for Novices, part two. We'll be looking at free word order, how polysynthesis arises, and where to go from here. Let's begin. One consequence of the fact that so much information about an event and its participants is encoded onto the verb in polysynthetic languages is that word order can be much more fluid than in languages like English, where word order is needed to distinguish subjects from objects. By no means do all polysynthetic languages have free word order. However, they are more likely to have freer word order than a more analytic language of the English type. In most cases in languages with relatively free word order possibilities, the actual order in a given sentence would be determined primarily by factors such as the discourse prominence of various participants, a desire to emphasise or background a particular event, etc. In general, newly introduced characters or topics would be expressed with nouns placed near the beginning of the sentence, while old, established characters or topics will be expressed with nouns towards the end of a sentence. Though, of course, this varies depending on the language and the precise nuances needed, and so on. Some languages go even further than this, and have completely free word order. The order of elements is determined solely by the current discourse needs. Such languages are known as non-configurational. There's a few characteristics that tend to go with non-configurationality, including extensively omitting noun phrases and discontinuous phrases. I'll discuss them, albeit only briefly. Omitting noun phrases. This is an extension of a property many of you will be familiar with from standard European languages, termed prodrop. In these languages, like Spanish for instance, where the verbs are inflected to mark their subject, subject pronouns are rarely used in neutral sentences. This is possible because the subject is already marked with a verb affix, so no additional specification of the subject is needed to make the utterance intelligible. So in Spanish, the normal way of saying I'm singing is Canto. In prodrop languages, when they appear, pronouns tend to be used for an emphatic purpose. Yo canto generally means something equivalent to the English of I'm singing, not you, Leonard, with emphatic stress. Non-configurational type polysynthetic languages, then, extend this pattern in two ways. First, since they mark both subject and object on the verb, there's no need to express either with overt pronouns. But secondly, they frequently drop entire noun phrases, not just pronouns. Even in mildly configurational polysynthetic languages, like Ojibwe, it's very rare for both the subject and the object of a verb to be expressed with a full noun phrase. Discontinuous phrases. Also called discontinuous constituents, this refers to the property whereby the individual elements of a phrase, say the demonstrative and noun of a noun phrase, do not need to occur next to one another. I'll provide a couple of examples from Ojibwe. One final note about non-configurationality, or free word order languages. While many polysynthetic languages have these characteristics, Many non-configurational or free word order languages are not polysynthetic. For instance, non-configurationality was first pointed out in World Piri, a non-polysynthetic Australian language, as in this example. And here's another example of a discontinuous phrase in a non-polysynthetic Australian language, Wambaya. Right, we've covered a number of the basic traits that polysynthetic languages tend to have, which should hopefully help with creating your own. But I suspect many of you are considering developing a polysynthetic conlang out of a non-polysynthetic conlang that you already have, or perhaps a future descendant from some non-polysynthetic natural language. A natural question, then, is what are some pathways by which polysynthesis can develop? I won't cover all the possibilities here, just a few in roughly the same order as the traits of polysynthetic languages we've discussed. Before getting into the discussion, though, it's important to know the basics of what grammaticalization is. Grammaticalization is the evolution of formerly independent words into grammatical markers, often clitics or affixes. During the process of grammaticalization, two things tend to happen. 
The first is phonological reduction or erosion of the word cleitographics, which is often irregular. And the second is semantic bleaching, where much of the specific meaning of the original word is lost as it comes to indicate broader grammatical relationships instead. I'll give a classic example from English to demonstrate the basic ideas involved. Originally, the expression going to only had one meaning, the literal sense of being in motion towards a goal. So, I'm going to meet with him meant quite literally, I'm on my way to meet him. It's easy to see, though, the connection this sense has with an intentive or future sense. If I'm on my way to meet someone, presumably I will actually be meeting him soon in the future. So, going to began to become grammaticalized into a marker of future tense, and now the normal interpretation of I'm going to meet him is the same as I will meet him. We can see this process of semantic bleaching. Going to no longer has a full lexical meaning in this use, but rather expresses the grammatical category of future tense. We can also see phonological reduction. In normal speech, going to, in its future sense, is rarely pronounced as two words, but rather as something more like gonna. Similar processes of grammaticalization have operated many times in English. For instance, the other common future form, the clitic u, comes from will, which originally meant want to, and in languages throughout the world. It is grammaticalization that can help to create new affixes, and thus greater synthesis, as we will see in the coming sections. Polypersonal marking. The pathway by which polypersonal marking on verbs develops is quite straightforward. Through grammaticalization, independent pronouns become cliticized with the verb root and eventually become inseparable affixes, often with some phonological reduction from their earlier form. Various Romance languages actually offer good examples of this. Most Romance languages continue the Latin system of already marking the subject with an inflection on the verb. However, Romance languages also mark objects on the verb as well, using pronominal clitics, though the placement of these clitics varies from language to language and depending on the exact situation. Some examples from Spanish can help demonstrate this. No me lo digas. Here, the subject is marked with the verb suffix as, as usual in Romance, and both the indirect object me and the direct object lo are indicated with clitics that are attached to the beginning of the verb. Ayer la vi. Here again, the verb is inflected to mark the subject, and the direct object, la, is marked with a clitic proposed to the verb. Damelo. Once again, the verb inflects to mark its subject, and the objects are marked with clitics, though in this case they follow the verb, and by Spanish spelling convention are written as one word. In fact, in a number of Spanish dialects, these clitics are well on the way to becoming obligatory person markers, and that they often co-occur with a co-referent full noun phrase, as in San Salvadorian Spanish, ya los lee los libros. Note that many of these object pronouns are reduced versions of the full pronouns of Latin. Thus, lo is an example from the Latin illum, which has irregularly lost its initial vowel in the process of grammaticalization into an unstressed clitic. Note also that unlike in Latin, these Romance object clitic pronouns cannot freely occur in many different positions. Instead, there are a limited number of places within the clause where they can occur, generally either directly before or directly following the verb. This is another indication that they have become grammaticalized and are no longer completely independent pronouns, but rather are partly on the way to becoming verbal affixes marking person. Many Romance languages, thus, are a good demonstration of the beginning stages of the creation of polypersonal marking. In fact, one Romance language is well known for having already developed true polypersonal marking, and is sometimes called polysynthetic. French. As an aside, I wouldn't call French polysynthetic, even despite the vagueness of the term, because French doesn't yet show the other features we've touched on, like noun incorporation and multifarious affixes. In its evolution from Latin, French has undergone a number of phonological reductions, which have ultimately resulted in the French verb no longer effectively inflecting to mark the person of its subject, as other Romance languages are capable of. There's a Wikipedia article you can check out called The Phonological History of French. As a result, French makes much more frequent use of personal pronouns than other Romance languages, but in unmarked contexts, these pronouns, in fact, have become fused to the verb, 
both phonologically and morphosyntactically. Though they are still sometimes written as separate pronouns in the standard orthography, there are arguments for considering them true verbal affixes marking person. Take the French sentence, je vais le lui donner. I'm going to give it to him or her. Though written as several separate words, this phonologically is a single word, je vais le lui donner. There are also syntactic criteria for considering this a single word, though I'm not going to get into them here. The point is not to prove whether spoken French should be considered polysynthetic. The point is that this provides an example of how polypersonal marking could arise whether or not French's pronominal verbal markers are clitics or true affixes. Noun incorporation. Marianne Mithen, in the same article proposing a typology of noun incorporation, discusses pathways by which the process of noun incorporation can develop. At its most basic level, of course, noun incorporation is simply a compound composed of a noun root plus a verb root, and thus the development of noun incorporation is, in many ways, as simple as a language coming to permit noun verb compounds as a productive process. Nonetheless, I'll note here a few ways in which some of the other common characteristics of noun incorporation can develop, and some examples of languages at various stages of developing productive noun incorporation. Firstly, Mithen notes a common tendency in many languages for verbs to coalesce with indefinite direct objects, and provides several Hungarian examples in which the referentiality and definiteness of the object affect the form of the predicate. Peter Olvasa's Ulshag. Peter olvas egy újságot. Peter újságot olvas. It's quite easy to see that we're well on the way here to true noun incorporation. When the object of a verb is not a clear, definite, referential object, but is rather indefinite and non-referential, and thus serving more as a modifier of the verb rather than an independent participant, it is more closely connected syntactically with the verb, which now lacks transitive marking. All that is needed to develop full noun incorporation is for such constructions to become lexicalized and to cease being nearly a marker of definiteness. Lahu, a tibeto burman language, takes this a bit further. While the noun and verb remain distinct phonological words, in instances of incorporation, the two are more closely tied syntactically and have a difference in meaning from unincorporated examples. For instance, compare the following two examples. To drink the liquor in question, as opposed to drinking something else, or to drink liquor in general. Again, these remain two separate words, but we can see here that in the incorporated second example, the liquor is no longer marked as a direct object of the verb, but simply is acting to qualify the type of drinking involved. Apparently, children are reinterpreting such structures as unitary syntactic words. For example, while adults normally place the negative particle ma immediately before the verb, as in the first example, Children sometimes treat the noun verb compound as a unity verb and place the negative particle before the entire complex, as in the second example. A similar case can be seen in some languages in Oceania. Take the following example from Mokalese. I'm grinding these coconuts. I'm coconut grinding. Note that while the verb and its incorporated object are still separate phonological words, in the incorporation manifest in the second example here, the verb and noun are syntactically bound to one another and behave as a single unit. In oceanic languages with this sort of incorporation, furthermore, the verbs generally involved behave as though they are intransitive. Recall that incorporation is generally a valence-reducing operation. The following example from Tongan can illustrate this well because Tongan is an ergative language. That is, the subject of transitive verbs, the ergative participant, is marked differently from both the subject of intransitive verbs and the object of transitive verbs, both of which are marked the same as one another as the absolutive participant. Na e no ae kava e sione. John drank the kava. Na e no kava a sione. John kava drank. Note how in the first sentence, without incorporation, the kava is marked as the absolutive, here the object of a transitive verb, with the preceding particle a, and John is marked as the subject of a transitive verb with the preceding ergative particle e. In the second sentence, with the syntactic, though not phonological, incorporation, John is now marked with the absolutive particle, and the kava is unmarked, thus indicating the verb is now intransitive with John, 
now the subject of an intransitive rather than a transitive verb marked as absolutive. Thus, we can see here several steps in the development of noun incorporation, from independent direct objects coalescing with a verb when they are indefinite and non-referential, to such nouns ceasing to be verbal arguments at all and becoming qualifiers of the verb. From here, we simply need phonological fusion of the verb and noun to have classic compounding and noun incorporation, of the kind described in section 4 of the previous video, Fireside Polysynthesis for Novices, part 1 of 2. Other affixes. I have a bit less to say on this topic. Partly this is because of the wide variety of things that fall under the umbrella of other affixes, but also because the origin of such other affixes are often very straightforward. In cases where there is evidence of their origin, they are normally derived from older compounding, either noun-verb compounds or verb-verb compounds. I'll provide a few examples here with the goal of providing a demonstration of some of the many possibilities open to you via the grammaticalization of older compounds. Instrumental affixes in numic. In many cases, the reconstructed protonomic instrumental affixes have clear similarities to reconstructed protonomic or proto-uto-aztecan independent noun or verb roots. Note that I don't know how current some of these reconstructions are, and they don't mark any of the germinating, spirantizing, etc. characteristics of numic morphemes. Ma with the hand, ta with the hand or grasping, ta with the foot, ku with the teeth, mu with the nose, with the head or shoulder, go, top or face, and su with mental activity. You pick post bases. Most post bases have no known connection to corresponding roots with similar meaning. However, there are a few post bases where the etymology seems clear, and the ultimate origin of most of the root post base combinations seems clearly to be from old compounds. A few post bases with identifiable sources are Tur, to eat or to use, from atur, to use. Charte, to hit in the body part, from acharte, to hit or slap with the hand. And myrte, injured or to be injured in the body part, from akmyrte, to hurt or get hurt. Spokane lexical affixes. Although most of the lexical suffixes in northwest coast languages have no obvious cognates and independent roots, there are several which do and which indicate that root plus lexical suffix combinations originated in compounds. The examples here are from Spokane, a Salishan language. This presentation glosses over the complex specifics of how exactly the lexical affixes are derived from independent roots. Essentially, roots that became lexical suffixes lost their initial consonant, and both roots and or suffixes could sometimes be reanalyzed as containing a connective affix <laughs> used in compounds or the nominalizer s. Ene, ear or surface, from tene, ear. Ulich, ground, dirt or earth, from stulich, the same. Elich, person, from skalich. It's a skin or hide, from sitzen, blanket. Che, urine, from che, to urinate. Schalt, shoulder, from schlacht, it is wide. A sickness from weight is sick. Aus conveyance or boat from sewus water. Asluk wood from luk stick of wood. Asqul roaster from qul roast. Asshin knobbed object, rounded object, etc. from shens stone. Eps buttock from pss, thick, and tsin, mouth, food, words, language, edge or shore, from tsin, to hum or speak softly. It is fairly easy to determine the origins of a number of the Khorasati verbal affixes are described in the previous video. I'll discuss them in the order in which they were presented in the last video in section 5.5. The indefinite prefix at, someone, is connected to the independent noun ati, person. As far as I can tell, its use as an indefinite prefix began with a form of incorporation, a process that can be easily seen in this prefix's use in nominalizations. Atasihka, policeman, literally person tire, from asihkan, to tie up. Atollo, 
a witch, literally a dangerous person from Hollon to be dangerous, and a tastahobachilka, a camera, literally people photographer from stahobachin, to photograph. The directional and instrumental prefixes of slots 7 and 8 have their origin in earlier free verbs used in clause chains. The final T of all these prefixes was at one point the same subject marker. Muscogean languages have a switch reference system where basically verb suffixes identify, whether the following verb has the same subject or a different subject from the verb to which the suffix is appended. So, for example, the origin of the general instrumental prefix ist is in proto-Muscogean constructions involving the verb isi to take. For instance, isi tayan, to take and go, becomes stayan, to carry, i.e. to go with something. The directionals have similar origins. Oht, go and, is from proto-Muscogean onat, to arrive there and, from the verb ona, to reach. And it, come and, is from proto-Muscogean ilat, to arrive here and from the verb ila, to come. A number of the specific locative prefixes can be seen to derive from older incorporated noun roots. Itta, action on the ground or in fire, may be connected to the Mikasuki noun iti, fire. O, action in water, is connected to the independent noun oki, water. Ba, action on a raised artificial or non-ground surface, is connected to the postposition bana, on top of. Ibi, action on the human face, seems to be related to the nouns ibi dala, face, ibi sani, nose, and ibi hikani, nasal mucus. Icho, action on the mouth, I presume, is derived from the proto-Muscogian noun ichoku, mouth, and nok, action on the human throat, is from the pr proto-Muscogian noun nok, meaning neck or throat. The ability suffix halpisa probably derives from an earlier clause chain construction, as with the instrumental and directional prefixes. The chain would have had consisted of the main verb, with the suffix h, subordinate connector, followed by a verb related to the modern verb stalpisan, to be enough. This form has the instrumental prefix st, so the original verb would have not had it and instead been alpisan. Where to go from here? So we've covered the basics of polysynthesis what it is, some of the many types of meaning and relations that can be marked on the verb in such languages, and some ways in which polysynthetic traits can develop. But where to go from here in developing your own polysynthetic language or in learning more about them? From personal experience, I can tell you the most effective thing is to learn a polysynthetic language. This takes a tremendous level of dedication and patience, so it's certainly not for everyone but it can provide you with so much more insight into some of the myriad possibilities open to you than reading a summary ever could. Failing that, simply reading grammars or grammatical sketches of polysynthetic languages would undoubtedly be helpful. There's been a good deal written about polysynthesis, and I've skipped over a lot of it, mostly due to having not read it all. I've glossed over the more theoretical stuff because I wanted this introduction to be basic, with the hope that it would be as accessible as realistically possible. In the meantime, the most significant theoretical work is Mark Baker's book, The Polysynthesis Parameter, and there have also been some good typologically oriented approaches to polysynthesis. I'd especially recommend two works by Miriane Mithun, her 1984 article on noun incorporation, and the book Languages of Native North America. And that's it, and as always, don't like and don't subscribe.